Listen now to the Easter reading as it comes to us this year from Luke's Gospel, the 24th chapter. Hear this word. But on the first day of the week, early at dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again? Then they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women who told them this story to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God shall stand forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Loving God, on this Easter morning, open our hearts and minds to the greatest good news we can know, that Jesus Christ is risen. Call us now to rise to new life of our own. Give us the assurance that neither death nor life nor anything in all creation separates us from your great love in Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. You may have noticed that we have kind of taken extra steps this year to bring in as much artistic expression on this day uh, as we can. Uh, The dancers at the beginning, uh, the, the choreography by Sarah Bay and Eric's narration and our dancers, so lovely, uh, trying to convey some of that excitement, the energy of the surprise of the morning. Uh, That's no doubt part of the feeling tone, that first Easter. And then, of course, wow, our music. If if that music doesn't lift you out of whatever grave you have been stuck in lately, I I, I don't know. I don't know what's going to do it. Uh, And then, uh, I don't know if you noticed, on the communion table, we've got one more thing, an art glass piece, uh, not just there for decoration. I borrowed it particularly for the service today. It's called Fusion Glass, and it was made by an Illinois Wesleyan University professor. Kevin Strandberg teaches art over across town at Wesleyan, and I borrowed this piece made by Kevin Strandberg from uh, Illinois Wesleyan's president, uh, Dick Wilson, and his wife, Pat. Um, I got it after I heard Dick give a brief talk about fusion glass that I found kind of wonderful and fascinating. The occasion on which he spoke about glass like this was at a a gathering not long ago over at Wesleyan in which a piece of fusion glass was presented as a present to Nell Eckley. Nell's right here today on the occasion of her birthday. Many of you know Nell for many years was Illinois Wesleyan's first lady. Her husband Bob was president for many years. And uh, so Nell got a piece of fusion glass. And before she did, um, Dick told us how fusion glass is made and kind of a little interpretation of what it means for him. Uh, I was very kind of moved by it. Uh, The way the glass is made, uh, maybe you already know, but what happens is there are fragments, just pieces of glass, fragments that are cut, some pieces maybe that are broken, depending on what the artist is trying to convey, and the, the fragments of glass are brought together by the artist and put in some sort of proximity to each other. Some are laid on top of one another, some just brought close together. And the artist takes some time to arrange it however he thinks it's going to look right. And then there's another piece of glass underneath, placed underneath, a piece or two on top, depending on what's intended. 
And then the whole shebang is stuffed into an ultra-hot kiln. It has to be hotter than normal, this kiln does. And uh, from what Dick said, the artist never knows how long it's got to be in there. You just got to leave it in there for an indeterminate amount of time. Uh, and the other thing that the artist never knows is what's going to come out when it fin you finally open the door. How's it, uh, what's going to happen? Uh, and, and as Dick explained, this is how it's made. And then he said for him, this has kind of come to symbolize a, a sort of metaphor for university education. Uh, he said, you know, the way I look at it, you know, the, the freshman students come to us and they're like the fragments, you know, they're, they got little pieces of talent, little, little uh, bits of, of, uh, of special giftedness, and, and it's the job of the university to take these disparate pieces of talent and, and put them close to each other and, and then kind of fire them in the kiln of the educational process, being mentored by wise professors and, and having experiences to travel or be engaged through the classroom and new learnings, that becomes the firing of that. And uh, lo and behold, these fragments become transformed, reconfigured, uh, often very wonderfully so. And when I heard that explanation, I thought, wow, it sounds like Easter to me, you know? What a great visual aid for what we celebrate today. What a lovely thing uh, to put up here to remind us of this power that has brought us all here today. God's power to bring beauty out of brokenness, newness emerging out of something that doesn't look promising as a raw material. Um, that's why we've all come today, and that's why this, I think, needs to be up here as a visual aid. It struck me that it's exactly appropriate to the morning because when you think about it, when those women got up that first Easter morning and made their way to the tomb, their lives were broken. They were fragmented. They were the pieces of what they had been when they were in the presence of their Lord and Savior as a teacher. All the gospel writers said they went to the tomb on Easter, none of them expecting that Jesus would be raised, even though he had told them that. It's an interesting uh, fact about Easter that some, the, the people who knew him the best underestimated him the most. Uh, so they don't go expecting to find him risen on the third day, as he had said many times. What they went for was to anoint his dead body. Uh, you remember that in the, the chaos of Good Friday, uh, there was not only no time to do that, and it was too chaotic to do that, it was also dangerous, you know, uh, to be even associated with him. And so, uh, Jesus died Friday afternoon, and his body had been hastily kind of thrown into a tomb, a rough-hewn tomb given by Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, the sun going down and the Sabbath beginning would preclude any work, any kind of work to anoint the body in the proper Jewish burial. So he was just placed in the tomb and the stone set, and that was that. And so now, Sabbath has ended. The Sabbath ends at sunrise on Sunday, and the women go. The dust has settled enough. They feel like it's at least safe to go for this grim funeral detail. Wondering, how are we going to get this stone rolled away? They're kind of a fool's errand in a sense. It doesn't make any sense that they could do it, but they go anyway, you know, hoping against hope. And of course, when they get there, all sorts of things are, are not what they expected. Uh, the, the stone is already bad, and the grave is empty, and, and, and that, now they see two messengers in dazzling white. That's an interesting detail, you know, maybe like the whiteness of the fire of a kiln. That, Fires art glass, I don't know, but they, these messengers are in dazzling white with a word. Do not be afraid. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He's not here. He's risen as he said he would. Remember how he told you all this. He is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he promised. Walter Brueggemann is a preeminent Bible scholar in our country, and he makes a point of observing that when any, anything important happens in the Bible, 
almost always it's accompanied by somebody who shows up and says two words. Anything important happens, somebody shows up with the same two words. Fear not. It says it's, it's, they're the most repeated words in the Bible. And you can see it over and over. Something important's going on. And, and the, the Israelites are making their way to freedom through the desert. You know, they've escaped the bondage of Pharaoh and they're making their way. And now they're anxious and, and they don't know that they're going to make it. And they're contemplating a mutiny of Moses. They're going to, you know, let's jettison him as our leader and we'll just go back to bondage. At least we got fed there when we were slaves in Egypt. And God shows up and says, fear not. Fear not, I will lead you, I will provide for you a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Fear not, I'll help you get through. Or you turn over a few pages and, and it, it, it's Christmas Eve and, and uh, the great grand announcement, the most important announcement that can possibly be made, the, the messenger of God comes to the, the shepherds out in their fields, keeping watch over their flock by night, working the graveyard shift with two words, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy, which shall be to all people, unto you is born a Savior. And then... Flip, flip, two more pages, four more pages, a few more pages back. Here they are. At the empty tomb on Easter morning, one more time, fear not. You seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He's risen as he said he would. In the Bible, Brueggemann says, it is fear, even more than sin, notice, it is fear that's the real curse of human life. And I think he's right about that. Fear more than sin is our real curse uh, because when you think about it, fear not only rattles us in the present moment, it also paralyzes us going forward. It paralyzes our future. So it, it, it hurts us on two levels. It hurts us in the now and it diminishes our expectations for tomorrow. And Brueggemann says, you know, when you boil it all down, really there are only two basic fears that any person has to come to terms with. There are only two fears, but unfortunately they're big ones. It's the fear of death and the fear of life. Uh, and, and, and to complicate things e even more, the two fears, the fear of death and the fear of life, are interrelated. And they're interrelated enough so that if you don't come to terms with the first one, the fear of death, you'll never be ready to tackle your, your life fears either. Fear of death. You know, is, was it Woody Allen who said, it's not that I fear death so much, I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> uh, all of us have it, but, but you know, until we come to terms with our mortality, with death, we never learn to live. As long as we fear death and the little fears that go along with it, fear of failure, fear of loneliness, fear of, of being defined by our past mistakes, as long as we fear death and the little corresponding death fears that go along with it, we can never really live for the best within us. I mean, the person who's overly fearful that the plane or the car is going to crash will surely never travel very far and spend life pretty much stuck at home. The person who fears failure, you know, if failing is like a death to us, then it's likely we'll never enroll in that class that we secretly have always wanted to take. We'll never attempt to, to offer that creative idea at our work that we think will make a difference because when you do that, you open the door to failing. Uh, and that vulnerability feels like death to somebody. The fear of death and the little fears that go with it inevitably lead to a fear of life and to a diminished future. That's why it's fear even more than sin. That's our curse. And why on Easter, the first and most prominent words at the door of the empty tomb, fear not. Because what has God done on this day if not given us the clearly powerful resource that we can be shored up right at the point of our deepest fears? What looked like the end is not the end. What looks like disaster and broken pieces is now forged in the fire of God's love and back among us just as he promised. And the only question now at the Easter tomb for those women is whether their awareness as his followers will be resurrected enough
to trust it, to see it, and to live it themselves. It's not obvious in the story, because when they go and tell the disciples, you catch that at the very end, the women went and shared with the disciples, but they considered it an idle tale, at least at first. We know that's not the end of the story, right? We know they woke up to it, but we're left wondering by Luke, I think rightly so, whether that reality of God's capacity to bring life out of our fears, whether it's really going to be powerful. It's not obvious to the disciples right away. Will, will they trust that power enough to see it's not just Jesus' resurrection we're talking about today, it's our own? When I was in San Francisco last November, I came across a story about four Northern California teenagers who one day, a couple of years ago, got themselves in big trouble. They went camping at a wilderness area on the Pacific Coast, not far from San Francisco, north in Marin County, if you know that area. And it was illegal to camp there, but they were kids and they went camping there. Uh, and, and also, what they did was build a campfire that night in that little area, also illegal in a state plagued with drought and vulnerable to wildfires. The next morning, they got up before dawn and got out of there before the rangers showed up. And before they did, they buried their fire and put it out. But some hours later, the fire reignited. Winds fanned it and it took off. And before they got it put out, it had burned 12,000 acres of pristine California coastland and consumed about 50 homes. Firemen were called in from all over Northern California to put the thing out, and when it was done, it looked like somebody had dropped a bomb on what had been previously a magnificent landscape. The four boys who started the fire, to their great credit, quickly went to the authorities and confessed. And they showed the investigators where they had been camping and where the fire had started. And one thing the officials noted was how carefully those boys had tried to put it out. They had buried it thoroughly, looked like a good job of that, but apparently the investigators think there were some embers still glowing underground for a time and probably a, a dry plant root had come in contact with the embers and, and burned up from the through the root system and caught a, a plant on fire some short distance away from the fire ring itself. So it was kind of a freak event, uh, but a huge disaster that they had caused, nonetheless. But anyway, the story is that some days af after the fire was put out, uh, a town meeting was called in the community that was most affected by the fire, and the residents all turned out uh, partly to thank the firefighters for their heroic efforts in, in uh, doing what they did, and also partly just to kind of grieve together and to contemplate what they were going to do next. There were a number of speakers, the mayor and the county board chairman, and among the speakers was the president of the board of firefighters, who gave a speech. He spoke from a prepared statement, but at the end of that, he uh, digressed from his notes and said something nobody expected him to say. He talked about how in ancient times when people did damage to a town, they would be banished and sent to live, you know, kind of outside the pale as punishment for what they had done and as a way to salve the fears of the community that they would never be subject to the mistakes that person had made in the future. Their banishment represented reassurance in those two ways. He then mentioned by name the four young men who had started the fire. And he said, you know, I've heard rumors that their families are thinking of moving away. And then he said to the townspeople, you know, I think today we should make it clear to these families and these young men that we want them to stay, that we're not afraid of them, and we want them here, and we need them here in the community. And at that, there was sustained applause from the townspeople 
at this meeting. And beyond that, uh, one by one, people whose houses had been burned down because of their recklessness came up and said, we agree with that sentiment. We want these young men inside the pale, not outside. We may not have our houses, but we do have a sense of community. And the fire, while horrific uh, it's, and has cost us our stuff, it's also taught us that we've still come through this with our relationships, which are what we valued most anyway. This community and our connections, more important than our stuff will ever be. So, so we want to say to these young men and these families, we hope you stay. We're not afraid of you. We want you here. And uh, there was a reporter who covered all this uh, from the San Francisco Chronicle. John Carroll was his name. And uh, in his article, reporting back, he said, it was among the most beautiful moments I have ever witnessed. A community which had just fought so stubbornly to save itself from a Holocaust still somehow had enough energy left over to save the future of four young men and the dignity of four families still somehow had enough energy. And we give thanks this day that Easter comes in so many forms, not just as a historical event 2,000 years ago, but as the mysterious energy we call God, that living reality that can bring together that brokenness and calm our fears, and in the light of which we can be a little more bold, you know, in our life, a little more joyous, a little more forgiving, a little more extravagant with our love and our embrace of the future. You know, the Gospels add one little detail at the very end of the Easter story, which I overlook most, most years, but this year I found it speaking to me. One little detail, it's, it's recorded in John at the very end. Mary and the women have gone to the tomb and they have finally recognized that they are standing in the presence of the resurrected Lord. It doesn't come naturally to them. They have the mistaken identity. Mary supposes he's the gardener first. Do you remember this story? Supposing him to be the gardener, they, they said, please, if you've taken the Lord, tell us where you've put him. And then he speaks Mary and she recognizes it's Jesus. And, and, and finally she wakes up. To Easter. And then John includes this little detail, which I have come to love. Uh, in, the, in the awareness that Easter is real, the first thing she naturally does is she goes over to hold him. Do you remember this? And he says, wait, wait, don't do that. Don't hold on to me. I have not yet ascended to the Father in heaven. And I've come to like that detail very much. I think it's very natural of Mary to do that, don't you? She knows he's the power of life, and so she goes, I'm going to hold on. I'm going to grab you right where I'm going. Come where I am. Stay with me. I want you here. And he says, oh, no. Don't do that. Easter's not about me staying where you are. It's about you going where I'm going. It's about you putting your hand in my hand and moving forward into a future filled with newness and fire and energy. Today's our day to say with, with Mary, we'll go where you're going. We don't expect you to stay stuck with us in whatever's got us perplexed. We want to go refire, renew, alive. So, you know, don't hold on to you. We'll let you hold on to us and pull us forward. That's, that's the promise, I think of Easter for all of us, to, to leave in that kind of energy with that good news ringing in our ears. Boy, the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised. What looks like the end really is just the beginning. So today's our day. Christ Jesus has grabbed hold of his new life and now in the miracle of God's grace, we too have the chance to rise to ours. Live boldly. Fear not. Happy Easter.